the three demons in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, many characters are introduced to us, some good and some who are evil. We see the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation, which is expected because the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. If you truly want to know who the Lord Jesus Christ is, open up the book of Revelation and the Lord Jesus Christ will be revealed to you. We see him in the book of Revelation as the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the Son of Man, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, the Bridegroom, and the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. In the book of Revelation, we are also introduced to the seven churches. The seven churches of the book of Revelation are Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These were important sites of early Christianity. In the book of Revelation, we are also introduced to the 144,000. These 144,000 witnesses are selected from the 12 tribes of Israel. They are sealed on their foreheads, and they are servants of the living God. In the book of Revelation, we are also introduced to the great multitude. This great multitude of people are those who are converted during the Great Tribulation. In the book of Revelation, we are also introduced to the two witnesses. The identity of the two witnesses of God is not known at present, but what we do know is that these two men are the representatives of God, and they come to witness to the world and perform miracles for three and a half years in Jerusalem. They warn the world and tell the world that all people need to repent of their sins. We are also introduced to dark characters in the book of Revelation characters that bring destruction along with them. In the book of Revelation, we are introduced to the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and they come with the beginning of sorrows spoken of in Matthew 24, verses 4 through 8. In the book of Revelation, we are also introduced to Abaddon, who is the angel of the bottomless pit. In Hebrew, the name Abaddon means place of destruction. The Greek title Apollyon literally means the destroyer. Abaddon is the leader of the demonic locusts, which will rise out of the abyss when the fifth angel blows his trumpet. In the book of Revelation, we are also introduced to the dragon, who is no one other than the devil, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, accuser of the brethren, the fallen one. In the book of Revelation, we are introduced to the beast from the sea with seven heads and ten horns. This is no one other than the Antichrist. In the book of Revelation, we are introduced to the beast from the earth. This is no one other than the false prophet. But today, we're going to focus on a time where the Bible tells us about a three-demon spirit that will be set loose on the earth. Revelation 16 verse 1 to 15 And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways, and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and the fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angels of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shall be, because thou hast judged us. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I hear another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, True and righteous are thy judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat. 
and blasphemed the name of God, which has power over these plagues. And they represented not to give him glory. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast. And his kingdom was full of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues for pain. And blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. And repented not of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. And the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are demonic spirits that perform signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle on the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief, Blessed is he that watcheth, and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. What are the things these three demons will do? Number one, they will perform great signs and wonders. In other words, they will perform miracles. Revelation chapter 16, verses 13 through 14 says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. It is important to note that one of the devil's primary methods of deception is signs and wonders. Therefore, it is important to note that as a child of God, we should not seek signs and wonders. The Bible clearly tells us that the devil and his demons can perform them. In passages of the Bible, they are described as lying wonders. Revelation 16 verses 13 through 14 is not the only time the devil will use signs and wonders as his tool of deception. If we look at the record of the beast from the sea, who is the Antichrist, and the beast from the earth, who is the false prophet, we see that they too perform signs and wonders to deceive people. Revelation 13 verses 1 through 2 says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw the beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. And then later on in the same chapter, we see the false prophet performing miracles. Revelation 13, verses 13 through 14 of the King James Version says, And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had the power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. The Bible does not go into detail regarding the exact miracles those three demons will perform, but what we do know is that their miracles will happen in order to deceive people. Number two, they will deceive people. These three demons will go across the world to fulfill the plan of the devil in the book of Revelation. To the natural eye, people won't see what's happening. To the natural eye, it will look like the kings of the east are operating by themselves. The fact that the Bible says they are like frogs doesn't mean they will appear like a frog to humans. To the natural eye, everything will look normal. But the Bible reveals to us that there are three demon spirits that will be pulling the strings in the background. The Bible was just telling us how unclean these spirits are. These unclean spirits are referred to as frogs because the ancient Jewish people regarded frogs as unclean and repulsive. What these demon spirits will aim to do is that they will gather people to battle against God. This is the preparation for the great battle of Armageddon, the time when the children of perdition will want to face the children of God and God himself. They were gathered by the beasts, the false prophets, and these three demons. 
when all these things are unfolding upon the earth, the church will be already raptured and will not have to endure the things spoken of in Revelation 16. Now verse 15 is my favorite verse in this chapter. Jesus says, Revelation 16 verse 15, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. In the midst of the preparation of this great battle, there is an assurance from the King of Kings. The assurance is, he is indeed coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is closer than ever. He will come as a thief. He will not make a public announcement. He will not distribute flyers to inform you of his coming. He will not secretly come and tell you when he will come because you are prayerful. He will not say that because you have fasted for many days, you should know when he would come. No, Jesus will come like a thief in the night when people are sleeping when people have forgotten about heaven, when people have forgotten about their garments, when people have neglected the words of the cross, Jesus would come. He said, blessed is he that watcheth. Jesus is coming soon and he will not announce his coming. The only announcement you will get is the one you are getting now. What you do with this will determine where your eternity will be. Jude 1 verse 14 and 15 says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints, to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse During his Olivet Discourse, Jesus described what will occur during the end times, prior to his return to earth. Matthew 24 verse 21 and 22 For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. These are the words of our Lord and Saviour. These are the words of our King. The words of the Judge and King of the Universe. So let us open up the Word of God and see what the Bible says will take place during the Great Tribulation. We will read a few verses in Revelation chapter 6. However, before we do that, allow me to set the scene. In chapter 5, we see at the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. This is Almighty God, holding a scroll in his hand. Can you imagine that? The creator of all heaven and earth holding something in his hand. And we see that no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth is able to open the scroll or to look at it. When John saw that, he began to weep and cry because no one was worthy to open it. But then there was one who was worthy to open the scroll and it is none other than the Lamb. And the Lamb is none other than Jesus Christ. 
The only one that has the authority to open it is the Lamb. The only one that has the power to open it is the Lamb. The only one that has the ability to open it is the Lamb. Who else has the right to open up the seals except the Lamb who shed his blood before the foundation of the world? And then we see the Lamb take the book from the one who sits on the throne, the one who is none other than God Almighty. Now let us see the judgments that come upon this earth. Revelation 6 verse 1 to 8 and I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering, and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword, and when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. You know what the opening of these seals tell me, is that there is a time coming that the world has never seen before. There is a time coming on this earth that this world is not ready for. Such will be the sight of those great days of tribulation, and mortal men in the end will be led to surrender their own might and acknowledge the greatness of Jesus Christ. They shall then turn to the rocks and say, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him who sits upon the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Revelation 6 verse 1 to 2 Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. There is something about this first creature from the seal. He was riding a white horse. He also had a crown given to him with a bow. He rode out as a conqueror who is all about conquest. If you read about this particular rider from different Bible scholars, you will find out that there are different meanings given to this rider. The white horse stands for peace. White means peace, and the bow he will use to conquer is an act of making people believe in him. There is one person I believe this scripture is pointing to, and that is the Antichrist. When we hear of the Antichrist, all we think of is the violence. We believe he will wage war and kill many people, which is true, but not initially. 
In the beginning he will unite the people of the earth before turning on them. The truth is that he will be on a white horse, which signifies peace. The Antichrist will preach peace and conquer the hearts of many people. Matthew chapter 24 verses 4 through 5 says, Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. Today, we can already see the stage being set up for the reign of the Antichrist, immersed in the systems, theories, and ideologies of this world through entertainment, politics, economics, education, and science and technology. Children of God must therefore hold firm to the true light of God's word, and they will not be conquered by this Antichrist. Number two. The Red Horse. Revelation chapter 6 verses 3 through 4 says, When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. The second rider is riding on a red horse. Red means blood. It signifies wars. The second rider will cause wars. He has a large sword with himself. Jesus mentioned this as the second thing also in Matthew chapter 24, verse 6, when he said, You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Jesus said there will be wars, and he said all these things must happen. The fact that many wars have occurred over the course of history does not mean that this rider has already arrived. After the Antichrist has preached peace, and after he has conquered the hearts of man, the true agenda will come to play. The Red Horse will come out and do its work. This teaches us that only Jesus, who is the Prince of Peace, can enthrone peace to the world, and not the government or the philosophy of this world. Not the Antichrist, because his peace will be fake and only temporary. We will see Jesus, the Prince of Peace, at work. The Bible foretells a 1,000-year period when Jesus Christ will create on earth a world of peace and justice without war and suffering. This period of time is known as the Millennial Reign of Christ. The peace that will come in this period will even affect the animal kingdom. The prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 10, saw a glimpse of the 1,000. Through 9 says, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, the nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the wean child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. What is described here is a complete change of the animal kingdom, a time when the nature of wild animals will be changed. A child will walk among them in safety with no fear. Not only will the animal kingdom be changed, but the state of our lives will be. I want to introduce the son of Enoch Methuselah, who is known for being the oldest man in the Bible, he lived to be 969. The Bible tells us that this age will be a normal occurrence for people during this time. We are told that health will improve so much so that not only will we be able to live longer and healthier lives, we will be able to walk amongst animals we wouldn't go anywhere near today. Society will be safer. Children will be able to play on the streets. People won't have to lock their doors. Life will be lived without fear. People can walk home at night with no worry. All this will happen after the Great Tribulation. Why? Because Jesus is the Prince of Peace. The book of Revelation is like no other book. A wise preacher once said there are two books that the devil hates most. Firstly, it is the book of Genesis because it reveals to us the true nature of the devil. And the second book is the book of Revelation because it reveals to us where the devil is going and that is the lake of fire. The book of Revelation shows us where the world is heading. 
As you read the book of Revelation, you can see that the things that were written in this book 2,000 years ago are slowly but surely coming together and falling into place. The ninth chapter of the book of Revelation shows us a remarkable view into the spirit world. In this chapter, we see the spirit world spilling over into our world. The ninth chapter is probably one of the most controversial chapters in the Bible. The late Wilbur M. Smith, who made the book of Revelation his special study once wrote, It is probable that, apart from the exact identification of Babylon in Revelation 17 and 18, the meaning of the two judgments in this chapter represents the most difficult major problem in Revelation. This chapter reveals to us the reader's two frightening armies that cause havoc, the army from the pit and the army from the east. But today we are going to focus on the army from the pit, the bottomless pit. A great deal of controversy among biblical scholars surrounds Revelation 9, 1 through 12. Some scholars argue that this is a description of literal locusts that come out of the bottomless pit. Others argue that what comes out of the pit are the decomposing souls of the unsaved. Other scholars argue that this is a description of fighter helicopters that John saw, and because of his time, the only thing he could relate it to was locusts. Others believe that it is an army of demons that will come out of the pit that can only be described as locusts. Let us read Revelation 9, 1 through 12. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven onto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power, and it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God on their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion, when he striketh a man. And in those days shall man seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates, as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots, of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings on their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue has his name Apollyon. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. John, the man who was shown what will happen in the end time on the island called Patmos, saw something spectacular. He saw that the things that come out of the bottomless pit have a leader, a king that rules over them, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollon. This story did not start here. We must have been hearing about this name called Apollon. There have been short movies and videos that have been made and titled Apollon. We must have also heard of Apollon the Destroyer before. We may know of this name, but many of us don't know who or what bears this name. We don't know the power of the entity bearing this name, and we don't have the idea of what the entity will do. 
Many people have believed that this particular being that John talked about was Satan himself. They believed it is another name for Satan because of the title that was given to this angel, the destroyer. But Apollon cannot be Satan, and I will explain why. Starting from what led to this part of the Bible, John was seeing trumpets sounded by angels and things were happening. As the trumpet sounded, each trumpet presents a disaster worse than the disaster that preceded it. The fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpets are called the three woes. The fifth trumpet was sounded by the fifth angel and something happened. Revelation 9, 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. John said a star fell from heaven. This same star was given a key to the bottomless pit. The bottomless pit is a place that can only be described as a place of detention for the wicked angels, or the demon's world. If we remember another thing John said about this bottomless pit, it is a place where Satan himself would be locked for a thousand years. We see this in Revelation 23. Here, this pit in Revelation 9, the pit is locked, but someone was given a key to open the bottomless pit. John said a star fell from heaven, and it was given the key to the bottomless pit. We were made to know that this star was a being, and the word he. The use of the word he is used to indicate that it was a being. The exact identity of this being who is given the keys is not known. Some argue it is Satan himself who is given the key, and others argue that it is an angel. The exact identity of this star is not explicitly stated. After the star was given the key, what did he do? The Bible says that he opened the bottomless pit. After he opened it, some locusts that looked like scorpions came out of the pit. The leader of these things was described in Revelation 9:11, whose name is Abaddon in Hebrew, and then Apollon in Greek, meaning the destroyer. The first thing we can know about this Apollon being is that he is locked up in the bottomless pit waiting to be freed. These things all came from a place called the bottomless pit. This should make us know one of the things that are in this place called the bottomless pit. It houses demons, angels of Satan, and all kinds of spirits that these angels control. There must be more angels like Apollon in this pit, but what we are concerned about is the Apollon who was given the power to destroy the earth. The fact that the Bible used the word locust doesn't mean they were ordinary locusts. If we look at the descriptions of these locusts, they look nothing like locusts. Revelation 9, 7-10, KJV. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as it were like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates, as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings were as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle, and they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. These things don't look like locusts. If we know what locusts are, they're like grasshoppers. They have hind legs which they can use to jump sometimes. They don't have human heads or human hair. They don't have breastplates. They don't have the shape of horses, and they look nothing like horses. That should tell you the description that John gave about these locusts doesn't mean that they look like the actual locusts, but the Bible scholars believe that he called them locusts because of their mission and their number. What do locusts do? The simple answer is, they destroy plants. Except these won't be destroying plants, and typically if you see a locust, you can't number them. They come in their thousands, hundreds of thousands. We see in the Bible that Satan fell with a third of the angels. Therefore, we know that the devil does have beings that work under him. The kingdom of Satan does have a hierarchy. That are some spirits that are evil and more wicked than others. Just like we have the archangels in heaven who lead the other angels in some specific assignments, like fighting battles and delivering the messages of God to human beings, we can see the angel Michael in the book of Daniel helping the angel that was held by the prince of Persia. We can also get the record of his war with the fallen angels and Satan in heaven. Revelation 12, 7 through 8, KJV. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought, and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. 
Angel Michael leads battles, and Apollon on the other side of Satan leads a group of demons or evil spirits that are described as locusts. It doesn't matter how powerful this angel is. It doesn't matter the number of things he can destroy. It doesn't matter the number of armies he has. His powers are limited. No matter how powerful and strong Apollon is, no matter how big his army is, he is not almighty. Only the Lord is almighty. However, the power Apollon will have during this period of time while he is on earth isn't to be played with. There is no better way to end the word of God than with the book of Revelation, the ending, the revealing of things to come. The book of Revelation unfolds to us the future and the things to come. The first book of the Bible is the book of Genesis, the book of the beginnings, where God started it all and created the heavens and the earth by his words. The last book of the Bible is the book of Revelation, where God consummates it all. The Apocalypse of John, where John was caught up into the Spirit while he was on the island of Patmos and went forth into the future to see the things yet to come. You and me are living in a time where the book of Revelation is unfolding before our very eyes. The book of Revelation should be more real to you now, more than ever. We are about to see the things that John saw on the island of Patmos. We are living in a time where the main characters of the book of Revelation are all about to take the center stage in human history. The beast of the sea is about to rise up from the depths of the sea. We know this because his spirit is already on earth. The beast of the earth is about to rise up from the depths of the earth. We know this because his spirit is already on the earth. And these two characters will be two of the major characters during the Great Tribulation. The period of time that John spoke of and the period of time that Jesus spoke of, where he stated that unless these days be shortened, there would be no more flesh on the earth. However, during this time of tribulation, during the darkest days of earth, during all the events recorded in the book of Revelation, the Bible tells us that God does not give up on humanity. The Bible tells that John 3 verse 16 is still true. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Bible tells us that God will send two men, two men, two witnesses to proclaim the love of God and to proclaim the judgment of God. These two witnesses are like no others that have ever walked the face of the earth. Revelation chapter 11 verse 3 says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. Throughout the corridors of human history, regardless of how dark and evil the times are, God has always had his witnesses. Let the Bible record speak concerning God's witnesses. Noah was his witness in pre-flood days, and for a hundred and twenty years he preached righteousness until the flood came. Abraham was his witness in Canaan centuries before the Hebrews occupied Canaan. Joseph was his witness in pagan Egypt. Gideon and other judges were his witnesses in the times of the judges when the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. Elijah stood for the Lord in the days of wicked Ahab and his wife Jezebel. Daniel was God's faithful witness in Babylon. And even from that point until now, there are witnesses of God in this world. People like you and me. And we see in the book of Revelation at this time, because the church has been raptured and is in heaven at this point, the sealed 144,000 saved from the tribes of Israel will witness for God and lead many souls to Jesus. They will travel all across the world as seen, according to Revelation chapter 7 verses 1 through 10. And then, Revelation chapter 11 verse 3 introduces us to two more witnesses. 
These two men will witness like no other and preach the gospel like no others that have ever preached the gospel. There are many theories or explanations telling us who these two great witnesses are. Some people state the two witnesses are the law and the prophets. Some people say the two witnesses represent the Old and the New Testament. Both of these are incorrect. The two witnesses are actual people. To men, not concepts, but actual men who come to preach the gospel to the people who are still on earth at that time. The fact is that the names of these two men are not explicitly written in the book of Revelation. So anyone who says they 100% know who they are is not telling the truth. We can make educated guesses, but it is important to highlight their names are not given to us. Some people say they could be Elijah and Moses. Some say they could be Enoch and Elijah. There are a lot of explanations that we can't give right now due to my time constraints. In my personal opinion, please bear in mind this is my opinion, the two men are Elijah and Moses. And the reason I believe this is because of what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration. Matthew chapter 17 verse 2 through 3 says, And was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. These were the two people who appeared to Jesus. What they talked about was not mentioned in the Bible. Biblical scholars who also agree that Elijah is one of the witnesses look to the fourth chapter of the final book of the Old Testament as evidence. Malachi chapter 4 verses 5 through 6, which states, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. More evidence that Elijah is one of the men is that he was also taken up into heaven. He never died. Elijah and Enoch are the only two men in the Old Testament that were raptured. Also, the miracles he performed are similar to the ones of the two witnesses we will look at later on. The second witness could possibly be Moses. Elijah and Moses appeared together on the Mount of Transfiguration, so they've already appeared together once before on earth. Scholars also believe this is one of the reasons why the devil wanted the body of Moses and Michael the archangel had to guard it. Jude chapter 1 verse 9 says, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. And finally, the miracles he performed in Egypt are similar to the ones of the two witnesses we will look at later on. It is important to highlight the fact that you and I don't know who they are. God has the power to empower anyone to have the qualities and the abilities of these two witnesses. These witnesses could be anybody from the believers. Or God could even create two witnesses. Only God knows who they are. They have been given the power to do some unimaginable things that we will look into. There's also a time frame that they will come and will live before they are killed. When will the two witnesses come to earth? They will come into the world during the Great Tribulation. Jesus said there would be a Great Tribulation before his second advent, a tribulation that has not been seen before on earth. Matthew chapter 24 verse 21 says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. When tribulation period starts, a lot of worldwide events will happen as told in the book of Revelation. The Lamb will open the seals, and each seal is associated with great events on the world as told in Revelation chapter 6. Then we also have the angels that will blow trumpets and some horrible things will happen. The two witnesses will come right after the sixth trumpet and before the seventh trumpet. This means that these witnesses will come during the Great Tribulation. What we should know about this is how great God is to send witnesses to tell people to repent. People will still get a second chance to repent and follow Christ, but not all obey. This is the same thing God will do when he will send his angels to preach the gospel of the Lord so that the world can change. Revelation chapter 14 verse 6 says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people. This shows the love of God for mankind, even in the time of the Great Tribulation. This is God trying to tell the people to repent and change for the better. These two witnesses will come during the Great Tribulation. 
We now know that they are not coming before the rapture. God has the power to give power to anyone he likes, anyone who's ready to work for him. Who told you that you cannot get the power of God right now? Who told you that you cannot be empowered and do miraculous things? If you are ready to be used by God, he will empower you. You might see yourself as a weak person. You may think you have no power in you and you cannot be used by God. Who told you God is looking for powerful people? If he wanted powerful people, then there would be no need to empower anyone again. God wants you. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27 says, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. So what are the things these witnesses will do? They will have the power to witness. We call them the two witnesses because of what they have been empowered to do by God. Witnessing is not an easy thing to do. Witnessing must be backed by the power of God. These men will preach like no other men before them. I want you to think of the best sermon you have ever heard. It will fail in comparison to what these men will preach. I remember a gospel town preacher who I used to listen to as a boy. When he used to preach, he could preach about hell so well, the actual temperature in the church would rise to the point it would make you repent. Oh, that man could preach hell fire. They will preach like no other man has ever preached before. You and I can't imagine what their sermons will be like. They will preach truth. And because of that, they will be hated. John 3 verse 19, men loved darkness rather than light. One of the things that come with the power of witnessing and preaching gospel message is the mark of God. This mark is called the touch not my anointed. If anyone dares touch those that have been empowered to witness, they will suffer the full consequences of the wrath of God. Never ever go after a man or woman that is called by God. Never ever speak negatively about a man or woman that is called by God. Because if you mess with him or her, you are messing with an eternal spirit being, God Almighty. And if you mess with God, the full force of heaven will be against you. The angels of heaven will be against you. The Bible says in Psalm 105 verse 14 and 15, He suffered no man to do them wrong. Yea, he reproved kings for their sakes, saying, Touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm. This is the same thing that will happen to the witnesses that God will send in the book of Revelation. No one will be able to touch them. Anyone who tries to do so will be dealt with. Revelation 11 verse 5 And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. They will have ability to breathe fire from their mouths. Secondly, they have the power to shut heaven. We have seen this kind of power in two people in the Bible. We can see it in the life of Elijah and Joshua. God gave them power to control the season and nature. They can control the heavens. This kind of power is limited to a few people. It is a power that makes impossible things possible. That is the power of God. Elijah prayed that there should be no rain, and Joshua prayed that the sun stand still and not move. These two witnesses will have the same ability to stop the rain. They will also have the ability to start the rain. If anyone has this kind of power, who in this world will be able to hurt them? You can tell the sun what to do, 
You can tell the rain what to do. That means you are controlling the seasons. Why would God give these two witnesses this kind of power? They are two witnesses. They are telling the world that Jesus is the Son of God. He has died and he resurrected. For the people believe this kind of report. and They must show signs that they were sent by God to tell them this truth. If the two witnesses are doing simple but still supernatural things, such as card tricks or repairing and disappearing, the people may think they are some kind of magicians. But a person who can control the seasons and nature shows you unimaginable power, the power of a creator, such power that can only come from God. Revelation 11 verse 6 a These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Thirdly, they have the power to strike the earth with plagues. The only person we have seen do this in the Old Testament, when Pharaoh refused to let the children of Israel leave the land of Egypt. He struck them with plagues. These two witnesses have the power to strike the earth with plagues. This is the reason why people will hate them so much and seek to take their life. At the end of their works on earth, the world will capture them and take their lives then. And there will be a time of great celebration. People will celebrate by giving each other gifts because for over three years these men have been untouchable. Let the Bible speak on what will happen. Revelation 11 verse 7 to 12 And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people, and kindreds, and tongues, and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a an half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Revelation 20, verses 1 to 3. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him out into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. We live in a world that is filled with uncertainty. Every day, conflicts are raging in the world. Neighbors argue with one another. Even family members argue with one another. There is so much distress, so much heartache, pain, and suffering. More and more we are faced with circumstances that challenge our faith. Living in general can take a toll on you. Everyone you come across in life is in a battle of some kind. Someone said hello to you today with a smile on their face, but they cried themselves to sleep last night. Everyone is in some sort of battle. 
Some are battling for their health, others emotional pain, others heartache, others financial turmoil. Just know, everyone is dealing with some sort of turmoil. But that will one day change, according to the Bible. Close your eyes for a minute, and imagine that all the turmoil has come to an end. The conflicts have ceased, and there is no longer any more selfishness on the earth. There is no more pain, nor sorrow. This is not the temporary and deceitful three and a half years of peace that the Antichrist is foretold to usher during the great period of the Great Tribulation. No, we are beyond that. Satan has been bound. An angel of the Lord descends from heaven with the keys to the bottomless pit. Revelation 20 verse 2. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil, or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. But what happens beyond this point? What will the world look like when the devil is no longer here? The verse I have just read ushers in a millennium of reign by Jesus Christ, along with those of us who are his. We find in Revelation 20 that God mentions the millennium six times. From verse 2 to verse 7, God says 1,000 years. 1,000 years. 1,000 years. 1,000 years. And in three of those verses, he refers to this period of time as the thousand years. So, what happens during the 1,000 year time? Everything I mentioned at the start of this sermon will no longer be an issue. No one will be in a secret battle like they are in today. No one will be battling for their health. No one will be in emotional pain, or heartache, or financial turmoil. Wouldn't you trade this world for that world? The Bible tells us that if you die at 100 years old, you are considered a child. Have you ever come across any 100-year-old children in your lifetime? Isaiah 65 verse 20 No more shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die one hundred years old, but the sinner being one hundred years old shall be accursed. But a transformation will have taken place under the reign of Jesus Christ. People will live incredibly longer, as they did in the days before the flood. No one in the Bible has ever lived a thousand years, but they will. Methuselah died at 969 years old. Jared died at 962 years old. Noah died at 950 years old. But during the millennial reign, people will live for a thousand years. Can you grasp that? People will ask each other, how old are you? And the person will reply, I am 456 years old. Imagine that. Can you imagine? Imagine that people will be living for a thousand years. You may say you wouldn't want to live for one thousand years on this earth. Yes, you would. Because Jesus Christ would have returned on this earth and he would have established himself as king in Jerusalem. Jesus will be in charge. He will be reigning over a world that accepts and acknowledges that he is the king of kings and the lord of lords. A world that accepts Him as the giver of life, and Him as the almighty, all-powerful God. A world that obeys His commands. The Bible tells us it will be a time of peace. Think about that. Peace will abound on this earth. No conflict between this nation and that nation. Peace will be the atmosphere of the earth. Not only peace, but joy unspeakable joy, joy in its purest form. The joy of the Lord will go out on the face of this world, and there will be no devil. He will be locked up. I would swap this world for that world in a heartbeat, in a heartbeat. 
The Earth has never experienced anything like this. Actually, the only time anything close to this millennial reign is the Garden of Eden. Back before there was sin, all the injustices you see in the world is because of sin. Every heartbreak you have ever experienced is because of sin. Every tear you have ever cried, it is because of sin. All the sorrow you see in the world is because of sin. All of the failures you see in the nature of mankind is because of sin. Sin bringeth forth nothing but curses and death. So now the saints will be reigning with Jesus on earth, and the world will finally be practically in a state of utopia, because Christ will be reigning. Magnificent things will happen during this period. The prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah 11 verses 1 to 10, saw a glimpse of the 1,000 years, and offered a very clear picture of this future for us. Isaiah 11 verses 6 to 9. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole and the weaned child shall put his hand on the viper's den. They shall not hurt, nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea." What is described here is a complete change of the animal kingdom, a time when the nature of wild animals will be changed. A child will walk among them in safety with no fear. Imagine that. Lions will be friendly. Rhinos will be friendly. Society will be safer. Children will be able to play on the streets. My grandfather told me about how 90 years ago, he and his brother, when they were both seven, they literally walked across town to their grandparents' house. Just the two of them. Two kids walking alone. And he said, nowadays, you won't see that. You can't let your children out of your sight in this world. But when, in the millennial reign, you will. People won't have to lock their doors. Life will be lived without fear. People can walk home at night with no worry. All this will happen after the Great Tribulation. Look at what will happen to the Tribulation Saints that will be saved during the Great Tribulation. Revelation 20 verse 4 And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads, or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The tribulation saints are the saints that listen to the gospel message preached by the 144,000. These are the saints that listen to the gospel message preached by the two witnesses. These are the saints that listen to the gospel message preached by the three angels. These saints will reign with Christ. The millennial reign is coming. 2 Timothy 2 verse 12 If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. The saints will reign and rule with Christ in his kingdom. Let us cling to this great hope in our Lord and bolster our faith. The millennial reign with Christ is one such assurance that lies ahead of us that we must strain towards. It is a glorious vindication of our suffering today. Jesus Christ has already apprehended this for us, and likewise, he has apprehended us for it. We must forget the things which are behind us, our hardship, sufferings, sins, turmoil, conflicts, anxieties, distresses, stresses, ailments, fleshly desires, failures. All these things are behind us. There is laid up for us a period without these atrocities. John states, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. This emphasis on thrones 
is to be viewed as an assurance of a particular season of delicate rain. Jesus Christ has already given authority to us, but this period that we look forward to in hopefully exciting ways will be unprecedented. This period will be wonderful. We will no longer need faith because we will be able to see Christ Jesus as he reigns. Take hope, beloved, that we will reign with our Lord and Savior in this reality and in front of those who are alive at that time. The kingdom of the Lord will come to earth as it is in heaven for 1,000 years. Whether a literal number or a figure symbolizing a prolonged period, we must fix our eyes on the quality of this time. We must know in our hearts that we will be vindicated in this era. Oh, the bliss, the glorious bliss that will reconcile our faith in Christ with this fate in Christ. We will demonstrate in this period the fullness of our calling as a royal priesthood, a chosen people, and a holy nation. All the earth will call us blessed. Jesus will confer on us, his saints. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The book of Genesis tells you where mankind came from, and the book of Revelation reveals to you where mankind is headed. Our Heavenly Father, in His Word, has told us about the events that will occur in the end times, notable and strange things that have never happened before are set to happen in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation opens us up to the future and at the same time to eternity. Strange things, things that you and I have never seen before, things that the human mind cannot comprehend, things that are not of this world are all set to occur in the book of Revelation. Angels are coming, horsemen are coming, cataclysmic events in which the world has never seen are in the book of Revelation. Celestial events which we have never seen before occur in the book of Revelation. There is no other book that shows us the collision of the spirit world and this world quite like the book of Revelation. Travel with me into the book of Revelation and off into eternity and let us look at some of the strange things that will happen in the book of Revelation. Travel with me past the seven seals, past the rider on the white horse who went out to conquering and to conquer, past the rider on the red horse who brings war and bloodshed, past the rider on a black horse who brings famine and scarcity on the earth, past the rider on a pale horse who brings pestilence and death, past the 144,000 who are sealed. Travel with me, past the 30 minutes of silence in heaven. The book of Revelation tells us that there is a time coming that mankind has never seen before. The judgments in this book are so profound that they cause absolute silence in heaven for 30 minutes. Revelation 8 verses 1 to 3. When he opened up the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Then the angel having given the golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with all prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Verse 7, the first angel sounded and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood and they were thrown to the earth and a third of the trees were burned up and all the green grass was burned up. Verse 8, and the second angel sounded and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood. The judgments continue on in the book of Revelation, but let us continue past these judgments, past the angel with the little book, past the seven vows, 
past the great white throne judgment and all the way up to the new heaven and the new earth. Revelation chapter 21 verse 1 to 7. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, and saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain for the former things have passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new and he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that a thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. Unusual things are scheduled to happen in the book of Revelation. According to Revelation 21, 1, we are walking toward a time in eternity when the creator God will make a total transformation of heaven and earth. The earth as we know it will no longer exist. Verses 2 and 3 says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. Just imagine seeing that holy city coming down. My friends, words cannot describe how moved you will be when you see the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. The holy city will literally be the biggest thing the most wonderful thing that you have ever seen. Revelation chapter 21 verse 15 and 16 says, And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city, and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof, and the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are all equal. 12,000 furlongs translates to 1,500 miles. 1,500 miles. Put that into your mind, 1,500 miles. Do you understand how big the new Jerusalem will be? Commonly, when we think about this holy city, people tend not to understand how truly big and breathtaking the new Jerusalem will be. Its length, width and height are all equal distances and that is 1500 miles. That means the holy city will go well beyond Earth's atmosphere, off into space. That is how big it will be. Listen, if a building, if a building was this high and it had 12 feet per story, the building would be over 600,000 stories. 600,000 stories. Look at the capacity of the new Jerusalem. It would be able to store 600,000 stories. 
if each story was 12 feet high, the city will be bigger than we can imagine. The construction of this city cannot do anything except fascinate you and me. The walls are jasper, which is a clear crystal. The city staggers imagination. You see, if you superimpose the holy city on America, you, you would find that the holy city would literally take up over 50% or more of the ground of America. This city will be the largest thing we have ever seen. The city has 12 gates, three per side. Each gate is made out of pearls with an angel standing out of each gate. In this city, saints of the old covenant and the new covenant will be united. The 12 gates are identified with the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 foundations with the 12 apostles. The 12 names here correspond with the original 12 apostles established after the ascension of Jesus Christ. John, Peter, James, Andrew, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew and so on. This tells me that these apostles were not average men. They were hand-picked, hand-picked, chosen, selected to go to the ends of the world proclaiming the gospel. And each of them did exactly that. And the foundation of this city will be the 12 apostles. On this new earth, the new Jerusalem, God's abode will come down and God will dwell with his people. Words cannot describe how wonderful this will be. Your imagination cannot take you there. It simply can't. It simply can't. The things that you will see in this place, the peace that you will experience in this city, you have no idea, absolutely no idea what is in store for the saints. Does this place not sound like home to you? Does this place not sound like home to you? A place with no more sorrow, that sounds a lot like home. A place with no more death, that sounds like home to me. Death is not allowed in this place. No more goodbyes, no more struggling, no more pain, no more sin. That sounds like home. A place where God will dwell with us. That sounds like home to me. A city that big would be the center of attention, but it, it is not. Do you know what is the center of attention? God really stands out in Revelation 21 verses 1 to 7. Is that God is among us. He is our Lord and our protector and our sustainer and he will dwell with his people. Human history begins in a garden and ends in a city like a paradise. Human history begins with perfect communion with God and it also ends that way. Look at verse 3 in Revelation 21. Three times, three times we find the term with them. It is as if God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit are all telling us that they will be with us. Look, three times it states, it states, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. God will be with you throughout all of eternity. Reading Revelation 21 reminds me of what the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ said to the disciples in John 14. I read this passage anytime when I'm overwhelmed with life because it reminds me no matter how difficult the journey is on this earth, 
The road leads home. John 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. Ye believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. I will come again. I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. And whether I go ye know, and the way ye know, Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me.